Hi everybody, um, my name is Christy Howell and I'm going to spend some time with you today talking about the circular economy. Um, I'm joining you today from my home office, as we all are right now, right? Um, I have capable assistance from my cats, Dobby and Tibby. Tibby's pictured here um, as the cat who does not get social distancing. My colleague, Crystal Antone, is our office's um, undisputed champion and expert on all things materials recovery. And she's pictured here with two of her pets, her dog Zero and her cat Daisy. Both of us are happy to correspond with you um, about any questions you might have regarding recycling and composting at JCCC, student employment in this work, or how wonderful our pets are. Um, our contact information's here and we certainly look forward to hearing from you. Here's an overview of what to expect today. We've got four big points uh, to make here. Explaining the circular economy, describing what's going on right now with the global recycling system, how we've rethought that process here on campus, um, and then we're gonna describe some of the biggest problems that we deal with on campus. The processes, problems, and solutions that you see here today may not apply in your at-home recycling situations. If you're experiencing an issue there and you have questions about who to contact, start with your materials handler. Um, then we'll offer you some other uh, resources as we talk today um, with regional groups such as RecycleSpot.org, um, which we really advise as well. If you get stuck after taking a look at both of those, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to help you figure out who to talk with or help you figure out a solution. One other thing that I'll mention is that this is Crystal's presentation um, and I've cut quite a bit out of it to keep its time manageable. Since we're off campus right now, for instance, we won't talk too much about paper towel composting in the campus restrooms or end user composting in the food court. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to expand on those things with you via email and so is Crystal, but in the interest of time, I'm going to try to keep today's conversation uh, focused on practices that apply across our broader community with some big examples of how they work uh, taken from things that we do on campus. So let's get started with a couple of definitions. Because some of these terms that I use today may be familiar to you, but you may not be used to hearing them in the way that I'm going to use them. It's important that we're all on the same page. Um, and for those of you who um, may need some additional support, my notes um, will be in the, the PowerPoint that I share as well. So you'll be able to read that rather than just listening to me if you need some additional help there. So materials management um, is something I'm going to use, a phrase I'll use a lot today. That refers to the more effective management of items that we typically put in the blue bin or in the landfill. And when we talk about materials management, we're talking about different streams of materials. Today we're going to talk a lot about single stream. We'll also talk some about cleaned streams or specialty streams of material. Clean streams, specialty streams, those are when the majority of items in a group are of the same type. While single stream refers to the mixed items that go in your recycling bin or your blue bin at home or out and about in your community. Contamination in this conversation is going to refer to anything that isn't recyclable or compostable by the rules in your community. The big goal in effective materials management is to limit contamination in any stream of material to make it more valuable to a commodity buyer. Commodity is a material that's going to be reused or remade into another item. First of all, let's look at what our current waste stream resembles. It's essentially a linear system. Um, it moves from the extraction of raw materials to the production of um, consumer materials over here, and then with an end in the landfill um, as waste. The shorthand that we use to describe current materials economy is take, make, dispose. The current system is wasteful, it's inefficient, um, in that when we get to the end here, we aren't taking advantage of any useful materials that might still exist at the end of that cycle. What might a more efficient system look like? Well, it would look 
um, a lot like a circle. It would waste a lot less in the production phase. It would focus a lot more on reuse at the consumer stage of the process, and it would be cyclical, um, where products at the end of their life become new products entirely, or become part of the next generation of the original thing that was made. The important thing to note about a circular economy is that it requires all three of the three R's. Remember, reduce, reuse, and recycle? All three of those things have to work together. You have to reduce the raw materials you use, you have to reuse scrap or use materials that you've had in the past, and then you have to recycle those materials at the end of their useful life. This points to one of the big ideas I'd like you to take away from today. For zero waste systems to work, the material at the end of the cycle has to be destined for a use which is as valuable as it was at the very beginning of the cycle that produced it. Let's take a look in this, at this system in practice. At JCCC, we call it our Zero Waste Landfill Initiative, and Crystal is our Zero Waste Coordinator, manages it. There are a lot of moving parts, and we're going to dive first in the one that's probably the easiest to see when you're on campus or the easiest to interact with when you're at home, and that's recycling. <clears throat> Here at JCCC, recycling, or as we call it, diversion from landfill, has been a huge part of our operations for decades. Starting in the 1990s, the Phi Theta Kappa Honors Society here on campus began an initiative to put all of our recycling revenue into the Student Scholarship Fund, which means if you've ever gotten a scholarship from the community college, at least part of it probably started as someone's properly recycled whatever. What kind of items do we recycle on campus? We recycle all the things you think of, items that go in your blue bin, for instance, one through seven plastic, more on that later, cardboard, paper, aluminum. But we also recycle several special streams, office paper, for instance. We collect those materials directly from our print shop to make sure that the waste stream is as clean as it can be. And these other kinds of waste that you see listed here on the right-hand side of this graph, um, books, glass, electronics, and metals, those are all separated out from our single stream as well. Why is this important? Because, and this is a really important point to keep in mind going forward, the more uniform and free from contamination your material is when it goes to the handler, the better. Contamination from other kinds of recyclable materials, from things that should really be in landfill, from food or whatever, um, all of those things can cheapen the price that you're likely to get per load of material when it goes to your, your handler. This has been a problem lately for several reasons. First, we have a lot of materials to reuse, a lot. US recyclers have billions of pounds of materials that get sent to China um, and Hong Kong uh, for sorting and reuse. But starting in 2017, global recycling buyers, of which again, China and Hong Kong are the most prominent stopped buying materials from the U.S. These restrictions hit post-consumer plastic waste the hardest, but they also apply to other things we would typically put in the blue bin. Unsorted paper waste, magazines, and paperboard or cardboard. What's wrong with the system to have created this problem? Well, the issue with Asian markets is one thing, but we also have a lot of commodities um, that we are creating, right? And so I mentioned paperboard in that previous slide, cardboard. Um, think about how many times uh, we hear people talking about ordering from Amazon. And so that sort of gives you an idea of how much more cardboard there is in the current recycling market than there used to be. But recycling was broken in the US long before China's announcement. They're just exposing the problems that we really need to fix anyway. We were sending dirty, trash-laden bales of materials that were badly sorted. 40% of Americans don't even have access to recycling, and many product manufacturers are creating materials or packaging that's not based with a recycled content material, and it's also not recyclable itself. This problem really didn't start overnight, though. Um, it's several problems in one. The first big one is that people wish cycle. What's wish cycling? How many times have you thought to yourself, 
Well, I'm not sure if this is recyclable, but I'm going to put it in the blue bin and hope that somebody else will sort it out for me later. That's wish cycling. Don't do that. We tell people, when in doubt, throw it out. It's always better to err on the side of something going in landfill. Because what happens when people wish cycle is more often than not, you're just introducing trash into your recycling stream. Around a quarter of what JCCC's recycling contractor gets is actually trash. When you send poorly sorted materials to your handler, you end up with poor quality products. Remember what I mentioned at the beginning that the material at the end of the cycle has to have high value too? This is where that problem comes into play. The second part of this problem is creating a demand. <clears throat> we have got to do a better job of buying recycled content materials. Here at JCCC, we've done that in a lot of different ways, but one of them is converting recently to 100% post-consumer content paper for all of our departmental printing. So we're addressing the demand for a high value commodity that we also put onto the market. Third, Americans buy a lot of single use products. Working to avoid single use through bulk buying, not taking single use utensils at carry out and all sorts of other things. These are things we should keep in mind. Finally, it's important to also keep in mind that we only recycle around 35% of the recyclable materials we dispose of. So being a smarter recycler is really valuable knowledge for both you, for your campus, and for your community. Locally, what this collapse in the recycling market means for us is that we've lost a lot of our recycling partners, especially in wood waste. And we've had to think more creatively about some of our formerly high value waste streams like paper, which we've only resumed collecting in a different process from our campus print shop. For single stream recycling, those blue bins most people think of first when you talk about recycling more broadly, we weren't even able to get a competitive bid for those materials at all unless they were unbagged. That's another point why at, at home, it's really important that you should follow your handler's instructions on not bagging what goes in your curbside bin. Again, you're usually gonna be asked not to bag. It's important to note here that we know our recycler is able to sell 70% or more of what they get to the domestic materials market. That's really important to us because we know that that helps make local jobs. Let's take a look at a place or two where we can still make money here at JCCC. So when we talk about making money um, in recycling, we are talking about selling our recyclable materials on the commodities market and then putting that money back into student scholarships. Um, it's really apparent here on scrap metal. Um, one point sort of that's more complicated is when we got our cardboard baler, cardboard was $200 a ton and now it's $59 a ton. Um, so that's a place where we've lost a lot of potential value over the past few years. Um, we've, we have avoided hauler costs um, with some of our processes, so we have had some savings there. But really, the day of free single stream recycling are over. Um, what we used to get rebates on, we now pay to make sure that it gets recycled correctly. At some point, we may start getting rebates again, but for now, we're really sort of settling into the idea that it's just going to be less expensive in the long run to recycle it than to landfill it. Um, let's look more closely at that area where um, you see those uh, climbing bars for the revenue that we've generated in scrap metal. <clears throat> Scrap metal is one of our more lucrative waste streams. Remember again, it's important to us to have a high value material because that revenue goes back into student scholarships. Um, during the re renovations on campus and the ATB, ATB building, uh, our interns were able to remove insulation from electrical wiring and copper pipe in order to get a higher dollar value from the material. This is where you can see that value of a clean material stream really in action. Just like with your blue bin, at home, the higher quality the materials you put in, the higher value they are to a recycler. On campus, the contaminant for this stream was insulation. 
Um, so our interns wore appropriate PPE and removed that insulation with hand tools before sending the material to the scrapyard. We got around $3,000 um, for each uh, truckload that went. And so we generate, generated quite a bit of money from that renovation for student scholarships. This is just one example of campus recycling improvement that's done a lot of good here at JCCC. There are broader systematic improvements going on in the region that are also really, really important and there are ways that you can get involved. Citywide materials management plans are being updated to reflect this new reality of the market um, in both drop-off centers and big events that help limit wish cycling handlers see and curbside pickup are very popular in our region. Regional governing groups like MARC have created guides that our local materials recovery facilities have all agreed to. One place we do really, really well is in glass recycling because Boulevard Brewery has created a closed system for the regional glass market in Ripple Glass. We have several offshoot businesses that use the material generated by glass use in the region. Ripple is a great example of a single stream that's very clean and high value being reused in ways that create local jobs. Much of the glass cullet that's generated in the recycling process goes back into fiberglass manufactured in nearby Gardner. Several local municipalities are hoping to replicate some of those successes that Ripple Glass has had regionally with other materials, um, composting and food waste and yard waste is one of those. So now that I've given you some bleak news with a few bright points because our interns are fantastic, um, let me try to lighten things for you a little bit. So even though there's a lot wrong with recycling, recycling is still the right thing to do. Even if the system is temporarily broken, we still use more biological resources than our planet can renew in a year. So lessening our demand for raw materials, that just makes good sense. Since 2017, recycling infrastructure development has increased, but it's gonna take time to backfill a production for all the demand. In the meantime, robotics are increasing accuracy and speed in the way that we do handle materials. In the next few slides, we're gonna take a little deeper dive into what happens with the kind of recycling that we're most familiar with, the kind we see at home, single stream. When you take a look at an item, it's typically gonna have some kind of label on it. This might not be true of items that are universally recyclable like aluminum. In that case, as long as the can is empty, it goes into the bin. But for items that do have a label, this graphic breaks it down for you. It will show you the chasing arrows. That indicates whether or not the item is recyclable, period. It will have a no slash through those arrows if it's not. Um, you can see that here in the middle. Um, you may also have special instructions, such as to rinse the item well before binning it. You can always take a look at the How to Recycle website over here, howtorecycle.info um, website for more information as well. At JCCC, we've worked to make these labels a little more explicit with lots of different messaging. Let's take a look at that. On campus, we can accept the following items in our blue bins. Cardboard, paper, plastic, bottles, and cans. Things we can't take in any blue bin on campus are plastic bags, styrofoam, uh, glass, or anything that still contains food or liquid. On the left side of this graphic, you can also see our most frequent contaminants. Food wrappers like chip bags and uh, candy bar wrappers, or uh, paper or styrofoam, drink cups, and straws. On the right side here, and this is also available from the fantastic website RecycleSpot.org. Again, that's the regional recycling information website that you should use in the Kansas City area. You'll see a lot of the same problem materials. Plastic bags are the biggest problem. They're called tanglers because of the way they get knotted up in giant plastic ropes at the materials recovery facility. To illustrate how this process works once you put an item in a blue bin, let's follow a load of recycling through the process. At the end of this, we'll answer the question of where things go when you throw them away. So a blue bin of materials on campus is unbagged and it goes to a, a, a MRF, a 
Materials Recovery Facility, MRF. We call them MRF, like short for Murphy, um, for short. It's our cute little nickname because we love these places. So within the MRF, uh, materials are dumped out of the truck and then they're scooped up by a front end loader where they go into a hopper. Items are then hand sorted. This is one of the reasons that we're so explicit about making sure um, most of the food and liquid is gone from any uh, container. Your hand sorting people here are probably not gonna see those items for a month or more. Um, so be kind and think of their hard work and uh, just keep them in mind as you throw things in the bin, make sure they're mostly empty. People pick out the trash in the stream by hand. Um, they remove especially plastic bags, which you see here, um, but there's lots of other weird random things. You learn a lot about people, um, by the way they throw things away. <laughs> um, this job has become a lot more dangerous for people who do this work in the past few years because of so many improperly disposed of needles. So again, keep in mind that actual people at the end of this cycle are going to be touching your trash um, and be kind to them, keep them in mind. More advanced MRFs also employ mechanical sorting. They have screens that help sort out items by weight and they use magnets and anti-magnets for material, for metals sorting. Optical sorters and air sorters help with plastics while the next generation of sorting also includes robotics. After items are sorted into the cleanest possible stream, they're baled and sold. Here you can see small plastics, paper, bulky plastics, cardboard, and aluminum, all baled and ready for weighing and sale. So let's take a second. Think like a manufacturer. This material by weight here at the end of this process is vastly more useful and valuable to you when it's properly sorted and baled than if you just bought a contaminated or mixed commodity. That's why it's so important to keep items out of your blue bin if they aren't supposed to be there. What kinds of items are they that shouldn't be there? So these items are not recyclable as single stream, ever, 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 and they're often found as contamination in our bins on campus. Paper drink cups, styrofoam serveware, plastic wrappers, bags, and block number six styrofoam or packing peanuts should never go in your single stream. And styrofoam, it's worth repeating, even though it's marked as a number six, it cannot go in single stream. These two over here on the right, the food contaminated paper, napkins, paper towels, and tissues, those can all go in on-campus compost. Or if you use a composting service at home, um, your area compost room may be able to accept them as well. You also may need to tear those items up if you have your own compost pile. Um, you may still be able to put those in the pile at home. Some items we routinely find in single stream are recyclable, but they can't be recycled in the single stream. This is that specialty stream that I was talking about earlier. Soft, stretchy plastics are the biggest problem for curbside collection. They get into the sorters and a MRF and they tangle everything up. They're called tanglers, they cause hazards, um, they, they just mess everything up. So um, if you take that material in your hand and you can stretch it just with your fingers, those items should go in collection bins at your area supermarket. That goes for plastic bags, bubble wrap that doesn't have paper on the outside, and packing pillows. Glass bottles, as mentioned earlier, those go in the purple bins provided by Ripple Glass. While textbooks are recyclable on campus in the bins in the bookstore, just make sure that you don't give us anything you've rented or that you're due a rebate on. Let's look at one more version of recycling that's really important to us here at JCCC. Compost. Compost is recycling? Absolutely. Um, composting is the process by which we recycle food waste into a soil additive, essentially. It's the same sort of process, we just do it all here on campus. This part of our campus recycling work is very important to the interns who make it possible. We hire up to five interns per year who are all involved in the work you've seen here. Um, they're paid a good wage and they receive a three credit hour um, credit, essentially, uh, for classes that they're enrolled in. It's the best upper body workout that you can get while getting paid to do so and getting a free class. 
Um, and our interns are really an invaluable part of the center's family. Interns move our composting bins, which are these large gray bins here, from dining services um, to the compost shed. They go into um, a mixer, which you see in the second photo here, and they are mixed with wood chips and sawdust. The addition of wood chips and sawdust allows us to balance all that nitrogen with some carbon. It also allows, to, allows us to soak up liquid too. Um, and those two things combined make a healthy compost. Everything runs through the in-vessel industrial composter you see here at the top of the screen. It stays about a week there until it's offloaded into the base that you see here on the bottom. Those have been upgraded in the past few years and are now concrete, um, but the process is the same. Interns learn to manage all the data collection. Um, they measure weights and temperatures every day for each bay, and then they move materials around with a lot of different kinds of farm equipment. Our compost operation is an example of a closed system. What that means is that all the compost we produce and use in this facility starts with waste from campus and becomes soil amendment on campus. Um, all of our compost goes out to the lab space for our sustainable agriculture program, our open petal farm. One example of a place where we have an off-campus composting relationship is with our paper towel and post-consumer composting in the restrooms and dining halls. Paper towel composting um, is something we now have in most campus buildings. This is an example of a composting stream that we aren't equipped to handle on campus because there's just too much volume. But by working with Missouri Organics, we're able to divert several dozen tons of material per year from our old landfill costs. We have a handful of reuse programs on campus that are limited to faculty and staff, but two of the most popular are programs that were started or advocated for by the Student Sustainability Committee and are available to all students. The use of greenies and reusable plates, greenies are here, these green plastic clamshells, and we strongly encourage you to use them instead of the single-use cardboard pieces in dining services. These are fairly expensive, these cardboard pieces are when they're used regularly, but the durable grainies and plates allow us to save money overall by avoiding the purchase of the single-use cardboard and by avoiding the weight of those items going to landfill or to our composting contractor. Students are welcome to use the grainies, always. Their weights removed from your purchase and then you return your dirty container to any bus bin and dining services or any campus coffee shop. We also have a 25 cent discount on any reusable coffee cup that you use on campus and then a coffee club that renews every semester it costs um, $5, $8 I think. Um, both of those programs, more details and more accurate details, sorry, um, are available on the dining services website. Um, but they allow us to uh, reduce the use of single-use coffee cups on campus. We always count all three of those programs, um, Greenies, Water Bottle Refilling Stations, and the Coffee Cup programs as big wins on campus. They're great and we love them, but they're not exactly gorgeous, um, although you know, maybe they are. Um, sometimes, though, we get to have a reuse win that's also really lovely to look at. The next time you're over in the market area of Student Center or on the second floor of the library, take a closer look. The wood in those areas has been reclaimed from gym benches that were replaced a few years ago. Our interns performed a lot of labor in order to get those removed, stacked, and preserved so that we could then reuse them. So what's next um, for Zero Waste to JCCC? We have a new materials management plan in the works to get us to zero waste to landfill by 2025. Um, and instead of the three R's, we really are working to encourage the four R's for campus consideration and for folks doing this work at home. So the first R is gonna be to rethink. Don't buy things when you don't need to. Check to see if you can borrow it from somewhere else rather than buying it and using it once, or if you can use a, a site like Craigslist or something else to avoid a new purchase. Of course, reduction by working with companies who have take back recycling programs or by pressuring vendors to reduce pack packaging and to preserve greener options. Reuse um, on campus, that means better use of surplus items that we already have here. Um, 
at your own home, that might mean um, refashioning something that you would typically dispose of into something new. Um, recycling, obviously, that we've talked about um, quite a bit here. Just being more intelligent as you recycle and thinking more critically about where things should go is really, really helpful. And then taking the time to learn about your own recycler is also a big part of being a better recycling citizen. So that's really the extent of the new info that I have for you today. Um, I ask you to remember your important role in changing the way that we buy materials. Seek out recycled content and the way that we dispose of them. Don't recycle. Don't forget that we have paid internships, campus leadership and volunteer opportunities on campus. Um, and these are just a few of the questions that we get the most often. Um, so you can take those away with you as well. Stay safe, do good work. Talk to you soon.